right, you're in the right place for that. We all need corporate collective worship together, and uh, we're going to get to learn uh, from God's revelation to us this morning, and so hopefully uh, you're ready for that, or you can get ready in the next 12 seconds. If you've got a Bible, and I hope that you do, or you can grab one of the paperback Bibles in the seats around us, we're going to be in the book of Haggai again. Haggai, so I'll give you a second to get there, especially if you're newer or you're newer to Christianity or maybe you didn't know Haggai was a book. Um, you can just start flipping. It's actually easiest to find in the Gospel of Matthew and then back up three short books into the Old Testament. And you find the book of Haggai. We started this four-week series last week. So we got a couple more after this week. And we're entirely in kingdoms of sand, and here's why. So Haggai is one of five books in the Old Testament that are post-exile books. So for centuries, God has warned his people through judges and prophets that their sin will have consequence. And we see the Northern Kingdom, like I said last week, carried away in Assyrian captivity in the eighth century toward the close of the eighth century. And then we see the Southern Kingdom of Judah carried away in 587, the temple destroyed, Solomon's temple, this grandiose temple destroyed in 587 by the Babylonians and King Nebuchadnezzar. And for almost 70 years, the people of Israel live in captivity in Babylon, in exile, away from the land of promise, away from essentially the presence of the Lord. And then finally, the Babylonians are overthrown by Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian. And Cyrus issues this edict in 536 that the Israelites can return to Jerusalem, return to Judah, and that they should rebuild the temple there. Solomon's temple should be rebuilt and they should re-engage in worship of their God there in their land. And so the people began to flock there in 536 and specifically a fellow of the line of King David and Solomon, his name is Zerubbabel. He's the appointed governor he begins to restructure the temple of Solomon. He lays the foundation. This laying the foundations takes about two years. And then work ceases. And we understood from the book of Ezra that the reason why the work stopped is because the people of God in their day, 2,400 years ago, were frightened by the threats of the people living around them, by the culture around them, who engaged with attorneys and, and immersed them into legal matters and got... Um, Cyrus and then Darius involved in that and eventually Xerxes involved in that and kind of created all this red tape. And if you continue to build the temple of the Lord, there will be opposition, there will be persecution, there will be imprisonment, uh, captivity again. So the people stopped. And by the time of Haggai, 14 years later, the people had espoused this motto, even though they knew what they were supposed to do, they knew they were supposed to obey the Lord and rebuild the temple. They had espoused this motto of, hey, you know what? The Lord clearly, through everything going on around us, has communicated to us that now is not the time to rebuild the temple. Now is not that time. That's for someone else for a later time. And they had refused from fear, equipped with excuses, refused to obey the voice of the Lord. And instead, they had gotten caught up in rebuilding their own kingdoms, their own houses and lands and produce and palaces. And that's that's where their mind had become fixated. Now is not the time. The culture around us has dictated. The fear in our hearts has declared that now is not the time to obey the Lord. And so we're just going to continue to build our own lives. And much like Solomon before them, Haggai comes along with the voice of the Lord and, and just reminds them, hey, like, This is not why we're here. This is not why we're here to to build our own kingdom. This is going to be pound to sand like sandcastles on the beach. This is going to be no more. This is going to be over eventually. And only what is done, ultimately what is done for Christ will continue on. And so get back to obedience to the Lord. Get back to submission to the voice of Yahweh. Get back to the honor and the glory of the coming Messiah, Haggai says. And that is the word that we heard. And so this week, unlike so often in the prophets of the Old Testament where the people refuse to hear the word of the Lord, this week we get to see what happens when the people of God obey. All right, so Haggai chapter one, verse 12 says this. Remember, this is coming out of exile 
They've heard the word from the Lord through Haggai the prophet, specifically given there. It's given at the Feast of Tabernacles, all the people together, but specifically to Zerubbabel, this individual of the kingly line, and to Joshua, who is from the line of Aaron, high priest. Then, verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all of the remnant of the people. So when you see this word remnant in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, it's really important that we understand this is not typically comprising the entire nation of Israel. So the entire nation of Israel, as hopefully we know, was set apart as God's, uh, God's representatives, his chosen people in the Old Testament's that he could showcase his goodness, his benevolence, his kindness to his people. But ultimately, so that true Israel, all those both nationally Israelites and Gentiles who trust in, looking forward to in the Old Testament, the coming Messiah, and looking back to the Messiah who has come and has died and has been resurrected, Christ Jesus, in the new covenant, they're part of true Israel. And so when it says remnant here, it is talking about those within the inhabitation of of Israel, the nation, who have actually placed their hope, their trust in the coming Messiah. So that's the remnant. Not everyone who's returning from Babylon is engaged in rebuilding the temple. Not everyone obeys the voice of the Lord, but the remnants, those who truly believe, do. And so we can just pause here for a second today because there are many, even in our day, more than 2,000 years later, who would claim allegiance to Christ but we do understand that while salvation is radically by grace alone, that grace transforms. And so there will be some form or fashion of obedience or activity that expresses our devotion to God. And that's what the remnant is doing here in the text. With all the remnant of the people, they obeyed. That is a key theme here in the text. They obeyed the voice of Yahweh their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as Yahweh their God had sent him. So I was out of town a couple weeks ago, up in Tennessee, trying to relax. I take a mini sabbatical of sorts every year, trying to relax. And it just so happens, you guys know how life is, especially when you're trying to relax. Uh, distractions come in droves oftentimes. And so they came toward the end of that week of just trying to relax, trying to re be renewed. On Friday, actually on Thursday evening, right after church, so I'm out of town, right after church, we get a text message picture from our neighbors who actually, they, they attend here, they're members at Building 28. And it's them in their house with their kids with our dog. And they're like, is this your dog? <laughs> like, yeah, so one of our worship interns, Riley, had been at the house all week. And Winnie, our ancient Pomeranian, I don't know if it's anxiety that we were gone. We're incredible owners. Um, but she had, she, had, uh, she had broken out. So at first I'm like, oh, it's got to be the long people. Because what do we do? We're Americans. We're humans. We're depraved. So we just like to blame people. And so I'm like, it's got to be the long people. They let her out. And so that's, that explains it. So just bring her back. Drop her in the backyard. She'll be fine. And then Friday morning, I got a phone call from Riley. Hey, Winnie, ancient Pomeranian, she's gone. I'm like, well, the pool guy came by, so it's his fault. Like, he let her out. And so I got mad at the pool guy. Turns out not to be his fault, so thankfully I didn't express that anger. And, uh, and so um, this search ensues from 11 o'clock until about a.m. to about 5 p.m., six hours, where I've got my brother Nate, uh, who's scouring the area and message boards and looking into the animal shelters around and Riley and and Vince, he's printing out flyers. He's going to walk around people's mailboxes and surrounding neighborhoods. And Whitney, one of our neighbors, she's walking up the street with her kids. They're all trying to find Winnie. And after six hours, I'm just like, oh, she's gone. Like, you know, she's, somebody's picked her up and they're going to take great care of her, not leave her alone for a week. And so um, <laughs> Nate calls me. He's like, I think I found her. She'd been picked up and taken to an animal shelter in Seminole. And um, Nate said, I'm going down there to pick her up right now. So these really nice people charged us a few hundred dollars to get our dog back. And, um, and so we got her back and he brings her back to the house at five o'clock that evening. And, and Riley sends me a video of her. Hey, she's great. Your dog's excited. And then I guess Riley steps out for the evening and comes back around eight or nine o'clock and calls me. And she's like, she's crying. She's like, uh, she's gone again. And there's no one to blame this time. 
There's no one to blame. And so I'm like, okay, little Houdini, my dog, has this escape artist. She's gotten out um, somehow through the yard. And she just, she's been doing this kind of for a year where people open the gate and she'll just bolt for the road as if that is the essence of life. She's convinced her mind that freedom from the restraints of this backyard that we provide for her, that freedom from these restraints is where it's at. That's where life is meant to be lived. But we all understand. doesn't matter if you're a kiddo in here this morning or teenager, senior, adult, whatever it might be. We all understand that's not where life is meant to be lived for her. We understand outside of the parameters of that fence is devastation, is accidental death, picked off by a coyote, hit by a car, whatever it might be. And so once again, my brother Nate jumps on the message boards and I'm like, okay, look, I'm not like a super subjective guy, but at this point, the Lord might just be saying it's time for her to go to heaven. I don't know, my dog, my dog that is. So, you know, I just, I just don't know. So I'm just like, I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm not being like, you know, whatever. Um, you know, you guys all think it too. So I'm just like, so she's just, she's gone again. And like at 9.30 that night, 10 o'clock, maybe later, Nate calls me. He's like, I think I found her again. This family had been driving down Nursery Road and those traffic just stopped, lined up, going both directions. Pouring rain, my ancient Pomeranian is standing there in the middle of the road, shivering with the soundtrack of Romeo and Juliet in the background, right? Like the, that's how I pictured it when I heard this. And so they, this family picks her up and they post on a message board and Nate finds it. And he, so he gets her and he's like, hey, you know what? I'm just gonna take her to my house. Clearly there's something happening at your house. So he takes her to her, his house. And what happens? She breaks out of his backyard too. Because somehow in her mind, once again, she's like, this is where life is meant to be lived. Freedom, freedom for me. It's exploration, enjoyment, excitement. That's it. That's where it is. And we're all like, no, you dumb dog. Like, listen to me. Listen to me. That is not productive. That is not excitement. That is execution. That's death for you. Now, I know you guys love it when I compare you to Pomeranians, okay? <laughs> but as I'm looking at Winnie last week and I'm reading Haggai chapter one and the obedience of the people. Look, we, t- we can talk about obedience and we should talk about obedience, but our obedience means nothing. If we, hear me say this, if we say we're obeying the voice of the Lord, but really we're obeying the voice within that has conveyed to us that this is what the Lord wants. I mean this, like there's lots, there's lots of Christians and I, I'm guilty of this too, that we're like, yep, I'm following the direction of the Lord when really we're just following the deception of our hearts. Like what, what, is, what does my soul communicate to me that, like we're really good at taking this, the, the revelation of God, and just making it say what I want it to say. And so in that way, we're not that different in some regards. Our minds weakened, our hearts stunted, we submit to well, we need to understand this. I think most of us get this. We're all submitting to and obeying a voice this morning. We do throughout our lives. The question we have to ask as Christ followers, what voice am I obeying? Like when he was obeying a voice, it was this voice inside of her little skull telling her this is freedom. This is excitement. This is enthusiasm. Are we guilty of the same? The people of Israel had been doing that for the last 14 years, just kind of obeying the voice within. But now they actually have heard and submitted to the voice of Yahweh, their God, through Haggai the prophets. And the people lived in fear. And we talk about this quite often here, but it's important, especially if you're new with us or new to Christianity. This is not like terror of the Lord that he's going to zap you for your transgression or for not obeying him um, completely, or, but rather this is a respect of the Lord, a circumspect awe before him. They live in fear of the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. And this is the Lord's message, and it's really all we need. I am with you, declares the Lord. Now he had made a covenant with them when they came out of Egypt it was a conditional covenant. I will be with you. 
I will represent you. My presence will be among you if you're faithful, if you obey. But now the Lord says to his people, I am with you. You haven't been faithful, you haven't obeyed, but I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So don't, don't miss this. The, the obedience of the people, very clearly, is not only called for by the Lord, but is produced by the Lord. He stirs them up. And the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius, the king of Persia. So as we kind of wrap down chapter one here, we've received one oracle from the prophet where he's called the people back to obedience to the Lord. And the people here have heard the voice of the Lord, not the voice within, not the voice of many counselors, but the voice of the Lord, and they began to obey him. And so at this juncture, as we wrap up chapter one, before we get to a second oracle, I think it's incumbent upon us. It's really critical that we ask ourselves this morning, okay, yes, have I heard the voice of the Lord? Have I submitted myself to scripture? But also, am I actually obeying that? Because just knowing what the Lord wants is insufficient. It's just insufficient. Like, you guys get this? Y'all are a savvy bunch. Like, you understand? Like, I, I think we understand. I went to the doctor about a month ago, a month and a half, I don't know. First time I've been in a while for my annual checkup, which is, we're dudes, so it's not annually, but it's our annual checkup. So I went and I sit down and they strapped a little blood pressure cuff on and they start taking my blood pressure. And they're like, um, your blood pressure's high. First time that's happened. I'm like, all right. And they're like, is there a reason maybe it's high? And I'm like, I just got a stressful email. And they're like, do you, do you get those very often? I'm like, yes, I do. And so he's like, oh, well, you need to come back in a couple weeks. He's like, you look like you're in okay shape. I'm like, what's your, what's your workout regiment look like? I'm like, non-existent. I don't work out unless like lifting a book to my face. Like, that's my workout. He's like, How, how's your diet then? I'm like, it's terrible. Like, it's just, I eat what I shouldn't. I drink what I shouldn't. Like, I, it's just terrible. How's your sleep pattern? That's all right at times, unless there's a lot in my head, which is typical. And so he's like, look, um, you're gonna come back in two weeks. I want you to like, he didn't even need to tell me. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't remember what he told me to do because I already knew. I already knew that I ate a certain way and lived a certain sedentary lifestyle and didn't get enough sleep and um, didn't deal with stress well and that was causing an elevation. So as I left the doctor's office that day, I had, I guess, at least three options in front of me. First of all, I could have texted all you guys and been like, hey, pray for me, which is just what we do. But I believe that's almost blasphemous when we're like, hey, pray for me that I'll do what God has already given me the strength to do. Like, but that, we do that. So I don't even know if that would have worked anyway. So I'm just like, no, I'm not gonna do that. Option two would be for me to be like, well, if the Lord wants me to have low blood pressure, <laughs> and he's sovereign, he'll give me low blood pressure. Like, it'll be good for me. Like, it'll be, like, we just do these stupid things, right? We don't, we don't, we don't espouse that mentality. With anything. There's not like a guy who has like a serious crush on a girl and is like, well, actually, it probably is. But most of the time, we're like, I know I have to actually talk to her, right? I have to like work some magic. And Jesus, I'm gonna need some of that magic on your part too to make this happen. But, but we don't espouse that. But when it comes to certain issues, we do, especially our spiritual vitality. But for me, like I'm looking at this going, okay, option two is I can just keep doing what I'm doing and just trust the Lord. I'm not saying we shouldn't trust the Lord, but the Lord seems to at times whack us with his truth and go, no, I've given you the power to do what is necessary. So option three for me, I, and I get it. I, I know I'm talking to people, potentially some of you whose blood pressure's out of whack for various reasons. Mine wasn't quite at the point where I needed medication yet. So I'm like, look, I can start getting better sleep, going to bed earlier. I can start trying to deal with my stress better. I can eat cleaner. I can do cardio and work out. I can do these things to try to deal with this. Like, we already know, like, there's not anybody here this morning who's like, I don't know how to be healthy. Or if you are, come talk to Trill afterwards. He'll help you out. But like, most of us are like, I know, I know what it means. The same is true. Like, this is so important. Like, it's so important because what I see, 
I say, uh, people, people ask me all the time. So I was talking to a couple people this week, and I'm like, I love being at Building 20. I love being the pastor at Building 20. One of the things years ago that I determined was um, that, that the time would be for me to go when the word that I'm declaring from the Lord is not motivating. It's just informing. Like, where we, we get it. We've got the mind minutia, the, the theological jargon. We've got it all in place. Our doctrine's airtight, but yet our lives are not actually expressing that. The people of God seemed to get what they were supposed to do for centuries. Fear had arisen within them and created these excuses for inactivity. But they knew what they were supposed to do. They knew what the Lord was calling them to. We get that hopefully as well. Most of us know we should be in church. We should be committed. We should be in community. We should be making disciples. We should be reading the word. We know what we're supposed to be doing. Are we actually doing that? Now we come to the second oracle. And this is where it gets, I think, really encouraging for these people who have, by the power of Christ, the coming Christ, submitted to and obeyed the Lord. Chapter two, verse one. In the seventh month, the 21st day of the month, so a couple weeks has gone by now, the word of Yahweh came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. And this is what the Lord says, at the conclusion of this celebratory feast of tabernacles where the people are supposed to be remembering the deliverance of God from their former captivity in Egypt. Verse two, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people and say this. Verse three, here's the word of the Lord. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? So don't miss this. The word comes, and here's the word. It's been 65 years since the magnificence, opulent temple of Solomon was destroyed by the Babylonians. But some of you were alive. You were kids, you were teenagers then. Some of you remember, and if you, and if you weren't alive, you've at least heard the stories and heard the rumors of the grandeur of this temple. It was absolutely astonishingly magnificent. We learn in 1 Kings, it took Solomon and his subjects seven years to construct this temple in Jerusalem. And now the word of the Lord comes to the people through Haggai and says, look at what you're building now. Is it basically, when you look at this and you remember Solomon's temple, what you're doing is nothing in comparison you like, I thought this was the encouraging parts. What well, is? Some commentators this week, as I'm reading, believe that what the Lord here is doing is he's reprimanding them because they did not build the structure with the magnificence of the former magnificence of Solomon's temple, the house of the Lord. But I don't think that's what's happening at all here. As a matter of fact, I would argue as you study scripture, while the Lord calls us to follow the examples, particularly the faithfulness and obedience and submission and worship of others, follow the example of Christ as Jesus walked, 1 John 2, 6, walk as he walked. Paul says, follow me, imitate me. There's a difference between following the example of and comparing ourselves to someone specifically in relation to physical behavior or activity or prominence. I don't think God here is saying to the people, hey, look, I see that you're trying to be obedient. You've got limited resources. You've got limited skills. You've got limited power. Um, Solomon was living in this kind of post-Davidic era of glory and beauty coming out of David's majesty with Solomon's wisdom. And he builds this temple and you don't have any of that stuff. You're coming out of Babylon, ill-sufficient resources. You're trying. You're terrible though. Look at what Solomon did. That's not the point here. The point is rather the people are looking at this. He knows what they're doing. The people are looking at the magnificence of Solomon's temple and they're looking at what they're building and they're going, man, this is, we might as well just stop. We don't have the resources. We don't have the riches. We don't have the skills. We're not Solomon. We can't do this. We can't make this happen. And the Lord says to them, essentially, stop looking at what Solomon built. 
Stop comparing yourself to that. We've talked about this many times before. Or I have probably at least once a year. This idea of comparison within a Christian life. Like now, me looking at somebody, you looking at someone who is emulating godliness and striving to love the Lord and saying, hey, like I'm aspiring to follow that worthy example. That's one thing. But for me to look at somebody, particularly not even their devotion to the Lord, but the skills that they have, the gifts that they have, like how I see it is there are some of us here who are going, man, when the Lord was handing out gifts, he just gypped me or he passed over me completely. And I look at other people who can sing or who can teach or who can write or whatever it might be. And I wish that I was me. Like I'm envious of that. Spurgeon speaking about this says this, the smallness of our gifts may be a temptation to us. I don't know if it's ever been you. Where you're just like, ah, I wish that my gifts were larger, were grander. He says, we are consciously so weak and so insignificant compared with the great God and his great cause that we are discouraged and think it vain to attempt anything. The enemy contrasts our work with that of others and with that of those who have gone before us. We are doing so little as compared with other people. Therefore, let us give up. We cannot build like Solomon. Therefore, let us not build at all. Yet, brothers, there is a falsehood in all this. For in truth, nothing is actually worthy of God. Like your best efforts, your most remarkable skills are not fully in and of themselves worthy of God. The great works of others and even the amazing productions of Solomon all fell short of his glory. So he's basically saying, instead of comparing ourselves with what Solomon has done or what David has done or in our day, what, you know, what a, a famous preacher or writer or Christian that we respect, what they have done, the skills that they have, instead, let's compare ourselves to the Lord. And realize he has given us these gifts that we may exercise them and everything that we all do individually and cumulatively fall short in comparison to his greatness. Uh, A.W. Tozer in his book, The Price and Neglect, went on to say this. It's a prayer. It'd be, I think, wise for us to espouse this. Dear Lord, I refuse henceforth to compete with any of your servants. They have congregations larger than mine. There's a pastor here. So be it, I rejoice in their success. They have greater gifts very well. That is not in their power nor in mine. You ever stop to think that? Like the people that we get envious of, the people that we compare ourselves to, um, like none of us um, received these gifts that we have based on merit. Like someone's, someone's yes, look, so, you can always find people more skilled than you. Those skills are a gift to them from the Lord. Like there's nothing I can really do. They have greater gifts very well. That is not in their power to have greater gifts, nor in mine. I am humbly grateful for their greater gifts and my smaller ones. I only pray that I may use to your glory the modest gifts that I possess. I will not compare myself with any nor try to build up my self-esteem by noting where I may excel one or another in your holy work. I herewith make a blanket disavowal of all my intrinsic worth. I am but an unprofitable servant. I gladly go to the foot of the cross and own myself the least of your people. If I err in my self-judgment and actually underestimate myself, I do not even want to know it. I purpose to pray for others and to rejoice in their prosperity as if it were my own. And indeed, it is my own if it is yours. For what is yours is mine. And while one plants and another waters, it is you alone who gives the increase. That's, that's an important prayer for us. Like, do we stop to think about that? I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating that the gospel success taking place across the wor world, across time, is our success. Because we're in this together by the graciousness and the gifting of the Lord. And you're called, and I'm called to utilize the gifts that God has given us to build what he has called us to build, not to compare ourselves with what others have built and the gifts and skills that they have. I've said it before, Mark Twain famously said, this is a humanist atheist who said, comparison's the death of joy. It is the death of joy. My, my, little, my little guy, um, probably, I don't know, probably a year ago now, I was 
in the bedroom with my oldest son, I'm reading him a book, Spurgeon's Eight, and my youngest son, who was three at the time, Augustine, he's standing by Spurgeon's wall. He's been, he's been playing with whatever he's playing with. And then suddenly I start hearing this banging. I look over and he has both hands on the wall and he's slamming his forehead into the wall, preparing for football season, I guess. Like he just, just slamming his head in the wall. I'm like, hey, Augustine, stop. And he laughs and he does it harder. I'm like, Augustine, like, first of all, that's annoying. Secondly, you're gonna need that one day. Like stop slamming your head against the wall. This is violence against the self. You read commentators, you read scholars, you read Christians who have gone on before, and almost all of them conclude that this comparison to others is a violence against the self. It cripples us in Christian obedience. Like like I said, almost every year I have to talk about this because it's so prevalent in our day, just everywhere. As a matter of fact, we had one of our young guys show up Thursday night. He was thinking about not coming because he literally said, um, as I'm driving around today trying to work, I... I'm just thinking about all the other Christians and how they're doing more and how they have better skills and how they have more knowledge than I do. And I'm like, man, what's the point? And then he comes to church and he hears this. And he hears Peter. Like I've talked about Peter a lot, John 21. It's one of the most fascinating and humorous passages in scripture to me where Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, can you imagine this? You're on the coastal line and you see the resurrected Jesus. You know him to be dead. And you see the resurrected Jesus and he comes to Peter there. This is why we love Peter. And he says to Peter, you're gonna do phenomenal work. You're gonna preach. Some people are gonna hate you. Some people are gonna get saved. And at the end of your ministry, just about 15 to 20 years, you're gonna be crucified upside down. That's your life. That's your legacy. It's handing out legacies today. And Peter, what does Peter do in John 21? You know it if you've read it. You remember it? Peter goes, he doesn't go, thank you, Lord, that I'm counted worthy to suffer for you and to proclaim your gospel. Instead, he looks around, he's like, okay, what about John? Like, <laughs> like what do you have for John? Like, what ticket is he gonna punch? And what does Jesus say to Peter? And what does Jesus say to us? Who cares about John? Like, it doesn't matter what I have for John. I've just told you what I have for you. You, obey me, follow me. Don't compare yourself to somebody else and what they can do. You're always gonna come up short. Obey me, do the work that I have called you to. That is what he's calling them to. Now, he calls them to this based on a glory. And this is what's for them probably preposterous, right? This is absurd, because watch what he's gonna say. He's like, okay, you're building this temple of Zerubbabel, the second temple. (laughs) And you're like, man, this is literally, it feels like nothing compared to Solomon's temple, to his work. Who was left among you, verse three, who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now, yet now, he doesn't say yet now, be as faithful as Solomon or as strong as David. He says, but now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares Yahweh. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak. Don't be discouraged in the work. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, in that strength, work. For I am with you, declares Yahweh of hosts. There is that refrain again that we saw in the first oracle. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, I am with you. You're being faithful, you're submitting, you're obeying. I am with you, I am your God, you are my people. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, a common refrain in scripture. Don't fear the Persians, don't fear the surrounding armies. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, yet once more, in a little while. In a little while. If you've ever been on a road trip with the children, you know that a little while to you doesn't mean a little while to them. A little while to the Lord could be thousands of years. But in his estimation, that's irrelevant. He says, in a little while, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says Yahweh of hosts. Which house? This house with glory. Zerubbabel's temple, this pathetic, pithy little tabernacle of praise. I'm going to fill it with glory. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares Yahweh of hosts. The latter glory of this house, here's the absurdity, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former glory, 
says Yahweh of hosts. And at this point, this is one of those times where we just, if we're the people of Israel, 2,400 years ago, we're like, oh, okay. That sounds cool. Yeah, this, this, what I'm seeing right now, this little lean-to of a temple, that's going to be more glorious. All right, God. That's not going to happen. And it, it didn't happen in their lives. Which is just frustrating because they were as impatient then as we are now. So a year goes by, and they're trying to finish up the temple. And then 10 years goes by, and the temple's complete. And 20 years goes by, and people begin to die from that generation. And they're like, I thought you said it was going to be more glorious. It doesn't seem more glorious. It doesn't seem better. And their children's generation dies, and their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren's generation dies. And 500 years goes by. 500 years, a little while. And then the glory of God, John 1, 14. And the word, the logos, the logic, Jesus is the reason why we understand anything. The logos became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we beheld glory as the only begotten son of God. Don't miss this. What Haggai is clearly prophesying here is not that the glory, the physical attributes of Zerubbabel's temple will be more magnificent than Solomon's, but that the glory that truly matters, transcendent wonder and honor and praise will be more remarkable than Solomon's because glory itself the Messiah in flesh will enter in and he does that. Malachi prophesies this as well in Malachi chapter three. The Messiah himself comes to his temple, enters into his temple, fills it with glory. And in that moment, the prophecy is fulfilled. And now what does he do? Does he live there in the temple in Jerusalem? No, we all get that. Instead, Paul's gonna write in 1 Corinthians chapter six that you are, believer, the temple of the Holy Spirit. That the glory of God himself comes to this desecrated vessel, this temple, and lives within Christ in us, the hope of glory. And so here's what we have a tendency to do. I finished up a book this week called Destiny of the Republic. Uh, if you like history, it's a phenomenal read. It's about the short presidency of James A. Garfield and his assassination. Uh, it, it sketches out various different historical characters, and one of them is a fellow named Charles Guiteau. You might not be familiar with that name, but Charles Guiteau was an aspiring minister and then an aspiring politician who was crazy, literally um, suffered from psychosis. And so he had these aspirations, and it, toward the end of the book, it paints this picture of Guiteau there in the fall of 1881, and he is writing letters to different state representatives. And he's saying, hey, I will come to your state, I'll come to your city and I'll speak, but it's gonna cost you thousands of dollars. I will sell this threadbare suit off my back for tens of thousands of dollars, which was a ridiculous sum in that day. Um, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to be announcing soon my candidacy for president of the United States. Now, all of that sounds uh, pretty ludicrous as it stands, but especially when you understand the context from which these declarations, assertions are made. Gateau is making all these claims from a prison cell in Washington, D.C., two months after shooting the president of the United States, Garfield, in the back. So he's just, he's proclaiming, literally he's proclaiming this glory concerning myself. And we're all like, man, that never happened. We don't even know your name. We don't really remember your works. We have to be reminded of the one tragic thing that you did in your life. And then within a few months, he's executed for that assassination. I'm reading Gateau's work and his aspirations of glory. And I'm just reminded, here we, here we are. So, so this is what's gonna happen. We're hearing today, glory. Glory in the temple and the coming of Christ. Glory in us, the hope of glory, Christ Jesus himself. Glory in the second coming of Christ. We're hearing all this stuff and we're like, okay, that sounds good. But we're so acclimated to disappointments in relation to glory. Not on the level of Charles Guiteau, but what happens for us is we proclaim, hey, this is going to happen and it's going to be glorious. And then whatever it is comes up short of glory or our politicians, our rulers, whatever it might be, 
people we respect, celebrities, our sports team, like if they only win, if they can conquer, if they're victorious, that will be glory. And then it happens and we're like, that's not that glorious. And then we hear the Lord say, glory that outshines the magnificence of Solomon's temple is going to be yours in this temple. And we go, all right, that sounds all right. But we're so acquainted with this disappointment when it comes to glory that we struggle to believe it. And it's not just the coming of Christ into that first temple in Jerusalem. It's not just that he is our habitation now in this life of sanctification and walking with him, that glory, but there will be ultimate glory. That's, that's actually, there's only one passage in the whole book of Haggai that is repeated in the New Testament. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26. And it is this reality of shortly in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth. And clearly in Hebrews 12, 26, it is not talking about the Lord coming in his first advent, but rather coming in his second advents in judgment and in glory and in splendor to correct that which is wrong and to set all things right. And what does he do when he does that? What, what happens? Well, he says here, and in this place, end of verse nine, in this place, I will give peace, declares Yahweh of hosts. And we get peace wrong. I think we get peace wrong because we think peace is like this, this feeling within. Like I've got to be at peace. I've got to be at rest. And rarely in scriptures, it's talking about a subjective peace. That can come, right? It can come. But rather, it's talking about something much more profound than that. 11, 12 years ago now, most of you know, I went to the dermatologist with a spot on my stomach. I've talked about this in past sermons. It was melanoma, deadliest form of skin cancer. Up until the discovery of that melanoma, I felt great. I was 30 years old. Life was grand. Everything was going well. But if the melanoma had been left untreated, I would have died. We get that. So while I felt at peace... There was not actual peace in my body. Dermatologist cuts it out, so I've been going back for the last 12 years, every six months to be scanned. And if you've ever had a diagnosis like that, you know you have these phantom pains, right? Like that just happens where you're like, oh man, it's probably everywhere now. Like I don't, you know, I'm probably dying again. And you, you don't feel, or at least I don't, I don't feel at peace even though every scan comes back saying, you are at peace. In Christianity, I mean, this is part of our culture, but it's just part of the devil within as well. Like, we put so much stock in our feelings, so much stock where it's, man, I've got to feel at rest. I've got to feel at peace. I've got to feel like I'm the best version of myself possible. And when... Haggai here says, Messiah will come and he'll shake the foundations of the earth. He'll enter into his temple, the glory of God himself, into the temple of Zerubbabel in the first advent. And then he'll come and he'll inhabit his people between advents. And then he'll return again at the end of time and unleash glory. The glory of God will cover the earth like the waters cover the seas. It's not just talking about, hey, you're going to feel good. That might come or it might not. We need to stop basing like our peace, our standing before the Lord based on that. Like there's too many people I talk to and they like doubt their position before the Lord based on their feelings. Our feelings are a liar oftentimes. There are other people who think they're great with the Lord because they feel great with the Lord when really they're not. So the feelings will come and the feelings will go and the feelings will trick us. And what he is saying here is that Messiah has come, the proclamation, we talk about this oftentimes, the proclamation here in the Hebrew is shalom, actual peace with God. You might not feel it, but by Messiah, by the death of Messiah, the one who gloriously fills the temple by his death and his resurrection, the promised glory, we're at peace now. And so really the call here is, I am with you, you're at peace with God. Therefore, hear his voice and obey. That's the second oracle.